Welcome to the Network Applications module. In this module, we'll be covering the fundamentals of networking and network design and planning for voice, audio, video, and data in a residential or MDU environment. Mixed-use network applications include voice, data, multimedia, video, wireless, and control applications. These can often use the standard cabling covered in previous modules but often due to legacy, each may need specific configuration. This module addresses some of these. Telephones have existed in some form for over 100 years. During that period, although the principles behind them have remained constant, the details of how they have operated and how they have connected to the network have evolved and taken many forms. How do analog phones work? The phone device itself consists of a base and a handset connected to the telephone service provider by a station cord. Cordless phones use a radio link between the handset and the base unit, but the base unit still connects to the service provider with a station cord. The phone requires a small amount of electrical power for two reasons, to ring the phone and to operate the telephone circuitry. In the old days, the telephone company provided this power over the phone wires. This is still true today, but only for the most basic telephones. Advanced telephones with integrated answering machines, displays, and other complex features require more power than the phone company provides. An advanced telephone usually has a local wall unit power supply that plugs into an AC outlet in addition to its telephone cord connection. A phone line is delivered to a house over a twisted pair cable with multiple pairs. Many phone companies use fiber optic cables in some form to distribute phone lines from central offices to neighborhoods. But for now, the line is always converted back to twisted pair copper before it enters a house. Each phone line uses a single pair of wires referred to as tip and ring. A single phone line can ring several phones, and, of course, an incoming call can be answered by any of the phones connected to the line, and a call can be initiated from any of the phones. It is possible to have multiple phone lines enter a house on a single cable, each on its own twisted pair. Each line would have its own phone number and would ring only the phones connected to it. We need to understand modular jacks and plugs. Modern phones manufactured during the last 30 years or so are connected to the phone line using modular plugs and jacks, not screw-type terminals. The plug is the male plastic connector on both ends of a station cord. The jack is the female socket in the outlet or on the phone. Before the Bell system was broken up, engineers at Bell Labs designed a family of modular plugs and jacks, differing in the number of pins and the definition of the pins. They also defined a variety of jack configurations, identified the jacks with RJ for registered jack and a number such as 45. These RJ specifications included modular jacks as well as other connectors. Many were defined, but there are only four that concern us here. Over the years, the common usage of the RJ designations has come to have slightly different meanings than the original RJ specifications, but that doesn't matter. The following describes the four common jack definitions used today, and these are adequate and useful for describing jacks and pinouts in the MDU system. Pins, or contacts, are numbered starting with 1 on the left side looking into the jack with the contacts up and release tab down. The RJ11 jack has space for 6 connections, 3 pairs, but only the center pair, pins 3 and 4, is connected to line 1. This is commonly used for a standard one-line telephone connection between the outlet and the phone. People often use RJ11 to mean telephone jack and often include two-line phone jacks, but RJ11 is defined to be a one-line phone jack. The RJ14 jack also has space for six connections, three pairs, and looks identical to the RJ11, with the center pair, pins 3 and 4, also connected to line 1. However, the next outer pair, pins 2 and 5, is connected to line 2. This jack wiring is required for a two-line phone, but works with a one-line phone. The RJ45 jack has space for eight connections, four pairs, and connects to all four pairs. 
It is used in all outlets and modules. A plug intended for use with an RJ11 or RJ14 jack fits into an RJ45 jack and makes proper connection to the inner two pairs. Thus, a standard phone jumper cord will mate perfectly with RJ45 jacks. These jacks are required for LAN connections and therefore are sometimes called data jacks. The RJ31X jack has space for eight connections, four pairs, but connects to only two pairs, the inner pair, pins four and five, and outermost pair, pins one and eight. This is a special purpose jack used for security system connections, allowing the security system to seize the line and make an alarm call. It must be used only for a security system, and if no security system is present, the shorting plug must be inserted for the system to operate properly. If nothing is plugged into the RJ31X jack, the phone line will not connect to the rest of the house wiring, and no phones will work. These are sometimes called security or alarm jacks. The TIA-568 standard defines a set of standard pin assignments for RJ45 modular jacks. The pin assignment most often used in the residential environment is called the T568A pin out. The other two common ones are T568B, commonly used in commercial buildings, and USOC, which is obsolete and should no longer be used. The standard also defines the color code of the wires in standard twisted pair cables and the assignment of color codes to jack pins. In the MDU system, all outlets hold RJ45 modular jacks. As shown here, a phone plug inserted into an RJ45 jack places phone line 1 onto the center two pins of the jack, which for an 8-pin jack are pins 4 and 5. This line connects to the blue-white blue pair within the twisted pair cable. Phone line 2 appears on the next outer pair, pins 3 and 6 in the RJ45 jack, and is connected to the orange-white orange pair. By far the most common type of device plugged into a phone jack is a single line device. A device is a phone, answering machine, fax machine, modem, or any other instrument requiring a telephone connection. Some phones are two line phones which have the ability to connect to two phone lines and answer or initiate calls on either line. Today, the most common way to connect ordinary phones within a house is to connect together all outlets throughout the entire house. This is called bridged wiring because all the outlets are electrically bridged together. When connected this way, when a call arrives, all phones ring, and the call can be answered by picking up any phone. Similarly, to make a call, any phone can go off-hook and receive dial tone. What is ringer equivalence? When a single telephone line is connected in bridged fashion to all outlets, each phone plugged into a jack loads the telephone line. To ensure that the nationwide telephone network performs acceptably, the FCC regulates the equipment that can connect to this telephone line, and this restriction must be respected. Each telephone device sold in the USA provides a ringer equivalence parameter which must be marked somewhere on the phone. You can calculate a total ringer equivalence number for an entire house by adding together the ringer equivalence of each phone in the house. The FCC mandates that the service provider, phone company, supports up to a ringer equivalence of 5. Most modern phones have ringer equivalence between 0.25 and 1.0, so this allows from 5 to 20 phones to be plugged into a single line. However, some phones may exceed 1.0, so be sure to check on the specific equipment before installing large numbers of phones. Old phones with mechanical ringers, a real bell and clapper and not an electronic warbler, generally use the most energy and have a ringer equivalent of 1.0, while electronic ringers are generally lower. Phones with ringer equivalents of 1.0 would restrict service to only five phones in the entire house. If the phones plugged in exceed the maximum allowed ringer equivalence, it is possible that none of the phones will ring when a call arrives, which is clearly unacceptable. What if I need more phones in my house? If a homeowner requires more phones than the line can support, an attractive solution is to install a key telephone system, or private branch exchange, or PBX, in place of many individual phone devices. 
Each of these is in essence a small telephone system installed in the customer's house. While there are differences between key systems and PBXs, for our purposes they act alike, and so we will discuss them together and call them PBXs. With a PBX, the telephone line from the service provider is connected once to the PBX and presents only a single load to the telephone line. Stations, phone sets in the house, are plugged into the system. When a call arrives, the phone system then can regenerate the ringing signal to each individual station. The advantage of this approach is that along with solving the loading problem, a PBX brings many other advanced phone features. For example, the stations can be used for intercom calls within the house. Multiple telephone lines can be flexibly connected to a subset of stations. Some systems incorporate messaging systems, voicemail as well. This type of phone system is generally more expensive than simple telephones, but provides much more capability and value in return for the added expense. Two ways to bridge wires. The diagram on the left shows a simplified representation of a single phone line connected in a daisy chain to four phones. Often this daisy chain meanders through the house on multiple branches, which may have been installed at different times by different people. This is how most houses are wired today. However, this is not how phones are wired with the MDU system. Instead, all of the modular jacks are wired in a star topology. The diagram on the right shows a star topology with a direct connection between each endpoint and the center of the star. The bridging that connects all of the arms of the star is accomplished inside the MDU. The advantage of using a star topology is the greater flexibility provided. By connecting all of the links together, it duplicates the function of a standard daisy chain bridge network. However, it can also easily support more complex voice networks with multiple lines or functions as well as other applications besides voice telephony. In addition, changes to any application can be made easily and quickly. Put simply, it is the star topology that allows support of many applications, not just telephones, and the flexibility to add and change applications at will. If a PBX or key system is to be installed, then each outlet should be connected directly to a port in the PBX, and none of the outlets should be bridged together. There are several ways to accomplish this. The simplest is to wire the room outlets directly to the back of non-bridged MDU distribution modules. PBXs require point-to-point non-bridged wiring from each PBX port directly to the station telephone set. Therefore, non-bridged modules must be used. Each in-wall outlet cable should be punched down to the proper pairs on the back of the module. A plug-ended jumper cord then connects each room outlet to a port in the PBX. Each jack on the distribution module should be labeled to identify the wall outlet in order to keep track of port and outlet assignments. Any changes to the PBX or jack assignments is easily accommodated by moving jumpers or otherwise altering the wiring at the MDU. Another application that can use the bridged configuration includes typical modem connections. Again, the reason for using the bridged configuration is because service providers want to ideally reuse the existing configurations and wiring to ease the introduction of new services. The configuration for ADSL modems is shown here. Forms of video in the multi-dwelling unit include closed-circuit television, CCTV. The input and output impedance of a baseband CCTV video connection is 75 ohms unbalanced, usually served by coaxial cables. However, these baseband video signals can also be supported using twisted pair cabling. The conversion of a 75 ohm unbalanced interface to a 100 ohm balanced UTP interface will require the use of a ballon, balanced to unbalanced adapter. This adapter also provides the impedance matching function. It is extremely important that the impedances of the signal source, ballon adapter, cabling and load are approximately the same. Any severe mismatch will produce unpleasant and unacceptable effects in the quality of the picture. These effects can include ghost images and ringing on sharp edges. The advantages of transporting baseband analog video signals over balanced UTP cabling are 
simplifies the cabling and containment requirements, eliminates ground loop noise on the cabling, provides for easy migration to newer digital technologies such as multimedia services over a common structured cabling infrastructure. In addition to providing composite baseband video, CCTV cameras often require a baseband digital telemetry signal in order to control PTZ functions. Control data signaling formats include EIA RS422, EIA RS232, 20 milliamp current loop, or Manchester. These signals have traditionally been sent on a shielded twisted pair separate from the video signal which is transported over coaxial cable. However, some camera control manufacturers superimpose the control signaling within the vertical blanking interval. For example, lines 1 to 21 of a 525 line frame picture. If such equipment is required, the appropriate ballon adapters must be used. This diagram shows a CCTV application over the solution with the PTZ telemetry signal transmitted on a separate pair, pair 2. If a telemetry signal requires two pairs, then pairs 2 and 3 will be used. The 75 ohm unbalanced composite analog video signal is converted to a 100 ohm balanced signal using the video adapter and transmitted over pair 4. The adapters allow several video and telemetry signals to be transmitted within a shared sheath in a multi-pair cable. This example shows how an IP or network camera can be supported. It runs on 1000 base T gigabit Ethernet. If the previous cabling has been coax based, it will have to be replaced. With structured cabling, it is just a matter of removing the old analog cameras and the ballon adapters and plugging in the newer IP network cameras. With the advent of IP or network cameras, the method of installing a CCTV system changes dramatically. These IP cameras are plug and play devices as far as the network is concerned. They are easy to integrate into corporate LANs or WANs. There is no need for multiplexing, coaxial cabling, ballon adapters, CCTV keyboards, analog VCRs, and tapes. An IP camera compresses the video and sends it over the LAN to a network attached storage or NAS device or a video server. An IP camera is always streaming video across the network and therefore is always using bandwidth. Hence, a separate or segmented LAN is recommended to avoid bottleneck issues on the main corporate network. However, some IP cameras now incorporate both server and DVR functions to limit some of the bandwidth impact. Pictures from an IP camera can be viewed and the PTZ movement, if available, can be controlled from a PC running a standard browser. Additional features include a built-in activity detection function that can be set to trigger an alarm or switch. For example, when there is movement in the field of view of the camera, the camera could set off an audible alarm or switch on a lamp or send a signal to lock a door. In addition, the captured image at the time the alarm was triggered can be sent to an email address or FTP server. A high-end IP camera can offer PAL output in addition to IP compressed video. There are many different compression methods that an IP camera can utilize. These include JPEG, Joint Photographic Expert Group, MJPEG, Motion JPEG, H.263, MPEG, Motion Picture Expert Group, MPEG-1, MPEG-2, MPEG-4, Fractal, and Wavelet. The main difference between them is their bandwidth consumption. Most compression methods are effective up to a certain point known as the knee, beyond which the image quality quickly degrades. An Ethernet LAN is a data network that can be used to connect PCs, printers, and other devices over twisted pair wires to enable them to share or exchange data. Devices connect to a star-wired twisted pair network with a LAN switch device at the center of the star and endpoints at the arms of the star. Only point-to-point -point wiring from the switch to one endpoint is allowed. In other words, only one device is connected to each arm of the star and daisy-chaining multiple devices is not allowed. On a historical note, when the original Ethernet was invented, it ran at 1 megabit per second and used 50 ohm coaxial cable in a bus topology.
Over the years, users and manufacturers have come to realize that a twisted pair medium using a star topology has many advantages as a physical layer, and coax-based data networking is virtually extinct today. And before you consider using coax just because it might already be in your house, realize that it's the wrong kind of coax. It's 75 ohm for TV signals and not the 50 ohm coax required for the old Ethernet system. An example Ethernet network is shown here. Although drawn as a separate rectangle in the figure, each network interface card, or NIC, is usually an internal card mounted inside a PC. A printer attached to one of the computers can be used by the other PC. And data can be exchanged between these PCs over the LAN. The wire pairs are in four-pair twisted pair cables. The switch is placed near the MDU. A 10 megabit per second or 100 megabit per second Ethernet LAN uses two pairs of a four-pair cable. Gigabit Ethernet or 1000 base T uses all four pairs. The diagrams to the right show the pins as if you were looking into the modular jack with the pins up and the release tab down. In the left side of the figure you see an eight position modular jack showing the pair assignments according to the T568A pinout. The pins are numbered from 1 to 8 from left to right. On the right side of the figure, the two pairs, orange and green, used by Ethernet are identified. The other two pairs, blue and brown, are not used by the LAN and are normally not connected to anything within the LAN devices. There are three methods you can use to implement an Ethernet network over the MDU system. In the first two, you wire up dedicated data outlets, restricting the use of these outlets solely to Ethernet traffic. The third method uses a shared outlet and a technique called sheath sharing, which uses a single four-pair cable and jack to carry the Ethernet signals along with other signals, usually telephone, on different pairs, and uses a breakout box at the end point to connect only the pairs needed to the Ethernet NIC and the other pairs to telephones or other devices. All three methods are field installable and can be installed or removed at any time. However, the sheath sharing method is not recommended for future flexibility and configuration complexity, so in this module we will concentrate on the dedicated outlet method. There are two dedicated outlet methods. The difference between the two lies in how the switch is connected at the MDU. This connection can be direct wiring or it can be indirect wiring. In the direct wiring method, the outlet cable within the MDU plugs directly into the switch device itself. The cables do not connect to any distribution modules in the MDU. This means that only Ethernet traffic is carried to and from these outlets. This diagram shows the connections made for our example network using the direct wiring method. We show the analog telephone, or POTS, connections. But notice that the voice network and the data network are completely separate. This is the simplest way to implement a LAN. A dedicated data outlet in the room keeps the NIC connection simple and there is no chance for confusion in the MDU about which cables are being used for data traffic. In the indirect wiring method, we configure a distribution module within the MDU to be a data distribution module. The LAN switch is connected to the rear of the data module and the outlet cable then plugs into the front of the module. Note that this module must be a non-bridged module. Data networking requires a point-to-point -point link and bridging multiple ports together will not work. In this method, once again, only Ethernet traffic is carried to and from data outlets. This method is useful if the LAN switch cannot be located within the MDU for some reason, or if the user wishes to terminate all outlet cables to distribution modules for consistency. Once again, the voice network and data network are completely separate. The ability to be flexible is seen as an increasingly important factor in the residential market. The network underpins the modern dwelling unit and therefore it follows that reliability, flexibility, and manageability are key requirements, but so too is performance, security, and mobility. Wireless solutions are clearly a popular fit for the modern dwelling unit. 
However, it is crucial to understand that the success of any wireless solution is largely dependent on following an integrated end-to-end -end infrastructure approach. An integrated approach focuses on realizing future requirements now and planning for them early. It enables the development of an easily managed and accepted solution for users. Ultimately, a complete approach boosts adoption, leverages existing infrastructure and applications, and reduces overall costs. Wireless LANs are a close cousin of wired Ethernet networks. The wireless alternative simply uses RF data transmission techniques in place of the wire used in Ethernet environments. In either the wired or wireless case, the network allows users connected to the network to seamlessly access disk drives, printers, and other peripherals on other connected systems. In fact, wired and wireless nodes are regularly combined on the same network with no distinction from a user's perspective. Wi-Fi or wireless fidelity is the popular term for a radio frequency wireless local area network or WLAN. Originally, the term was used to refer to the 802.11b standard. However, it is now used generically to refer to any type of 802.11 network. In 2000, the term Wi-Fi was promoted by the Wi-Fi Alliance as the global brand name for any 802.11-based WLAN product in an effort to stop confusion about WLAN interoperability. Any products tested and approved as Wi-Fi certified, a registered trademark by the Wi-Fi Alliance, are certified as interoperable with each other, even if they are from different manufacturers. WLAN access points create a cell of coverage for mobile users. An access point, AP, in a wireless environment is synonymous with a router or switch in a traditional network environment. By plugging in and configuring an AP to attach to the wired backbone network, WLANs give wireless PC card equipped computers access to the network. Generally, the AP is the bridge for the mobile client, for example, a notebook PC in an enterprise LAN to get on the wired network. When planning an integrated wired and wireless infrastructure, the first key step is designing the cabling infrastructure to support wireless APs. Note that the cabling for wireless APs is usually in addition to, and not in place of, the regular cabling. The approach taken is to simplify and generalize the cabling infrastructure design so that WLANs can be accommodated even as the technology changes over time and the building can be pre-cabled for easier and more cost-effective AP installation. The design approach is to create a grid pattern in the area to be served with the potential to locate wireless APs in each grid block. The grid pattern is independent of current building layout and places an outlet such that the distance between any two adjacent outlets is less than 20 meters. Wired and wireless LAN systems should provide users with constant access to real-time information anywhere in their dwelling unit. This mobility supports productivity and service opportunities not generally possible with wired or wireless networks alone. Users are potentially more effective and efficient when they can look up information anytime, anywhere. From an infrastructure perspective, mobility does not uniquely mean wireless technology. It is clear that the majority of implementations are best achieved with a mixture of both. That completes the Network Applications module. Thank you.